and we're, we're late. <laughs> we're <laughs> late and we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome. If you love podcasts, if you are making a podcast, if you need some podcast super friends who know what they're talking about when it comes to podcast production, then you are in the right place. My name is Catherine O'Brien. My company is Branch Out Programs, and I'm here with my super friends. Why don't we go around and just say hello? We are, we should say right off the bat, we are expecting one super friend to pop in. So we'll see if he joins us by the end. Uh, Johnny, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Howdy, howdy. I am Johnny Podcasts. I am a podcast producer from Fort Worth, Texas, and I love making podcasts. Matt Kendall. The Sound Off Podcast Network is located up in Winnipeg. Um, I produce a number of podcasts at varying degrees, some from beginning to end, and other ones will just uh, put a little finishing touches on some of the audio. But uh, we've been doing podcasts since 2016, and uh, like Johnny, we love it. And let's just say, when you say degrees, we mean temperature degrees, and it is cold and chilly wherever you are, correct? Is that what you meant? 75 and Ugh. and mosquitoes today in, in Winnipeg. 75 and disgusting. Enviable. <laughs> Jag? Uh, John Gay, Jag in Detroit Podcasts. I believe that nobody knows your story better than you, and I can help you tell it. I edit podcasts, I create podcasts, and I even co-host podcasts. And like everybody before me love the industry and happy to help and share whatever knowledge I can in the group today. And just in the nick of time, David Yass coming in from Boston. Tell us who you are. Introduce yourself to the folks. Yes. Sorry, I'm late. Technical difficulties here in Boston, but they've been solved, I believe. You can hear me, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. David Yaz, pod617.com, the Boston Podcast Network, producing podcasts and talking nonsense on the microphone like the rest of us. <laughs> Let's get into the nonsense right now. We are well so happy to have everybody here. We are the Podcast Super Friends. We are a group of podcast producers that meet monthly to talk about all things podcasting, especially to be able to serve our clients better. But we thought it would be great to come on and talk to people who are interested in the podcast industry, whether you have a podcast, are thinking about podcast, uh, podcasting, or if you are a producer, we thought this would be a great way to connect with other podcasters and really do some really wonderful information sharing. We have a little bit of a theme today, but I, you know, we it's okay to go off script if we want to. But the theme today is retro. There are some definite ruts that people can get into when they're podcasting, and so we are going to talk about some of those ruts. But more importantly how to get out of those ruts, or how to avoid those ruts to begin with. How does that sound, gentlemen? I'm in. Started. Yep. Sounds like a plan. Very good. Okay, well, I want to talk about the first rut that I know so many podcasters know about, they are thinking about, even if they haven't stumbled into this rut yet, it's looming in the background, and that is the growth rut, or the audience growth rut, to be more specific. We are in an industry where there's a lot of focus on growing your audience because, of, obviously, we make our podcasts for people to listen to, and when you get started podcasting, some rude awakening can happen with your podcast. And everybody starts asking the question, how can I get more downloads? That seems to be a perpetual question that comes up with all things podcasting. And I think that's a great rut to start talking about and to get some good perspective and to try and avoid that rut as much as possible. And I thought, Johnny, I wanted to start with you because in your great newsletter, you just recently wrote about the summer slump. And the summer slump, I think, is related to the sort of the audience growth rut. Can you talk a little bit about the summer slump and what people should be looking out for? Yeah, the summer slump is something that we all talk about. And I don't think it's really written down anywhere. And it's not like an established canon in the podcasting world. But we've all seen it all of us, the five of us we work with, probably combined, you know, in the triple digits worth of clients. And we look we have access to all of their uh, metrics, their downloads and for whatever reason, June through August, the downloads just go down. It doesn't matter if you have a huge podcast or you're just starting out. People travel during the summer. People are getting outside. COVID is over. Uh, people lockdowns are over and done and people are getting back out into the world and they are just not spending as much time with your podcast. And it's really demoralizing to a lot of the hosts out there who have small audiences and big audiences alike you see your numbers go down and you start to second guess yourself and you go what am i doing wrong i haven't changed anything do i need to do some kind of drastic shake up to my show maybe mm -hmm. bring on three guests at a time maybe completely branch off and do a whole different section of content that i'm normally doing and 
the advice that I give to my clients, I'm sure is similar to the rest of the group is just keep doing what you're doing. You have to understand that your downloads are going to take a dip during the summer. And so that's kind of what I've coined as the, the summer slowdown. Yeah, I think that's this is a good reminder too is that when you are like a super fan of podcasts like most of us here are our habits don't necessarily reflect the audience habits. So for example, the, I always often find that I'm doing things that are counterintuitive to what the general podcast listening audience is doing. So for example, for me, when I'm traveling, that's when I'm listening to podcasts more. That's when I'm trying to discover new podcasts that I don't have in my the rest of my regular repertoire. And, you know, I find myself listening to more and more podcasts over the summer, but that's not what everybody else is doing. Right. So it's like, I can't think of, look at the, what's happening in podcast listening um, and think like, oh, well, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts. So everybody else must be doing it too. You know, does that make sense? So it's like the summer slump is a real thing, even if that doesn't reflect, there's a lot of sort of counterintuitive uh, nature with some of these things that happen. Do you think it's also like another factor would be the podcasting world skews to, I mean, I think it skews older. I would say that it skews older people that are out in the working world, professional people are listening to podcasts and their kids are out of school. So you're now mm. that time spent taking them to school, picking them up to drive home, taking them to practice, whatever it is that would normally be filled with podcasts. The kids are now stuck or are now, I guess, stuck for the parents, stuck at home. They're not at school. So that's less time that you would have with your earbuds in. You got to focus on your kids. Right. And, or also like you maybe listen to something you wouldn't have your kids listening to. Too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there Gentlemen, is my dad wrote a porno, but that's, for, you know, depending on your taste of <laughs> who likes it and who doesn't. <laughs> right. right. Uh, guys, how, how else do you sort of prep your, your clients or talk to communicate with them about the summer? I tell them it's not a slump. It's just delayed. And mm. so Johnny was pointing out that there are people who have to take their earbuds out. They have to play with their kids. You have to play with your kids at this point <laughs> because they're nagging. They need a snack. They need this, that, and the other thing. But instead of looking at it as downloads that aren't going to happen, look at it as just delayed downloads. I like that. So I like this that. is where it's really important to market. You got to get back on your Twitter, your LinkedIn, and you have to stay on your schedule and kind of double down on, on marketing. You may want to post a little bit more if people are missing weeks, maybe post about last week's episode and the episode from the week before and, and change up the marketing strategy throughout. This is short attention span theater in the summertime. You know, podcasting isn't the only form of media that goes through this. In radio, there are morning shows that go for long uh, vacations. Uh, TV for years, going all the way back to the 1970s, they didn't make new episodes of Dallas or the love boat. It was all reruns and repeats. We're not by the way, telling you to do reruns and repeats by any stretch of the imagination, but, but this sort of disrupted habit is, you know, that occurs right through August. There also comes this silver lining and opportunity. And that's the last week of August and the first week of September. Mm. When you start to hear back to school or see back to school ads, wherever you live, that's your opportunity to go fishing for some new listeners because there are going to be new habits that are going to be starting up and that's going to be a great time. And I don't want to say to make up all that listening that you missed because you haven't missed it. It's just delayed listening, um, right. but you get to go and, and recapture it again around back to school time. As soon as you see that Staples, it's the most wonderful time of the year commercial. It's time. It's go time. <laughs> Matt, you, you said something earlier, earlier every year, by the way. Yes. You said different marketing strategies off the top of your head. Do you have any like specifics to one platform? Like if you were just posting exclusively to LinkedIn, how would you change up your marketing strategy for someone to kind of take away from this and put it into practice right now? Well, there's two things you can do. One, one is to double down and to do an extra post. Okay. And maybe that extra post is going to be look back through your library over the last six months. And maybe there's, an episode that performed really well four or five months ago mm -hmm. that you want to bring back and remarket to the audience. Maybe they want to listen to that episode. You know, maybe it's at the beach or they get a little bit of time at the lake. Um, bring back something that worked four or five months ago. It's actually something we should be doing all the time. A lot of us don't do it. We mm -hmm. always work week to week, but this is the opportunity to go back and pull out some gem that you had and say, Hey, this is one of our most popular episodes. Right. And who doesn't want to listen to the most popular episode from a podcast that they're thinking about following? I'll say, right. I'll say this on the other side of it, from the guest side of it, Matt had me as a guest on his podcast 
uh, quite a while ago now, every once in a while I'll get a notification on Instagram that that episode is being promoted. And I, I, cer- I hope I wasn't your most popular episode. I don't think I was, but, <laughs> but, just the, but Matt and his social media team with their clients, they do such a good job of repurposing content and advertising it. And I talked about my transition from radio to podcasting, and there's always a new angle on it. I'm always notified that I've mentioned in their story that he's still promoting the, these episodes perpetually. It's a great example. Yeah, I have a client that makes a habit of doing the, he calls them the in case you missed it posts. And so he'll do in case you missed it, you know, last month I had on this great guest. The the way people listen to podcasts to pick up on uh, Matt's point is is a lot different than the way they consume other things. I, right. I, I do a music nostalgia podcast and we normally get um, yeah, on, on any given day, like uh, 150 downloads is is a pretty good day. And then throughout the, the course of the week, people will pick up on this weekly podcast. But I just noticed that the last one we post, we got um, like 250 downloads on a single day. That's actually a great day for us. I took a look and only about half of them were of the most recent episode. Hmm. So that's, that's, so that's, you know, uh, 120, but whatever, a lot of people were clicking on the old episodes. So podcasting does, you know, you've got a library of content and you can, sometimes it, it might be pr- um, inspired by something in the news, you know, um, I don't know, there's some celebrity divorce and you talked about a celebrity divorce, like, you know, eight months ago, in case you missed it, we talked about this eight months ago on this great episode and take a listen. So, or, or you had, or you tie it directly to, this is where keeping in touch with your guests is so important. Um, you know, I, I like to follow a lot of the people that I do podcasts with on social media to see what they're up to. And this is a great way to pick which episode you want to promote. You can kind of piggyback off of, uh, I guess the buzz that's one of your former guests is getting if they are, you know, get hired to a new role, they release a new product. If they're like, I do a lot of the podcasts in kind of the business world. So if they get, you know, promoted to a new role, move to a new company, release a new product, something happens that creates a lot of buzz on social media. You can kind of tap into that and be like, Hey, by the way, John Smith is in the news and we actually had him on our podcast three months ago. Here's a recap of that episode. You can kind of get a deeper dive into while he his life while he was building this product or whatever he was doing. Even at LinkedIn has those work anniversaries. So-and-so is celebrating five years at this position. Oh, well, yeah. I had him on the podcast a year ago. Take a yeah. To Johnny's point about uh, relevant content, this is where keywords can be so useful in when you include them in your show descriptions and also transcripts if you're able to do so. Because if you have something that is going to be relevant down the road, if you have all that information documented in your uh, keywords, in your show notes, in your transcript, if somebody's searching for a topic that pops up into the news weeks, months, years later, you want to rank in their Google results for your podcast. That's why uh, transcripts and um, and uh, show notes are so important. Absolutely. And, you know, before we move on from this, uh, you know, Matt said something that I think is really pertinent for people who are doing seasonal shows that that first week of September or just the end of August into September, that's kind of like second new year for people yes. is that people are programmed to think of that as a second new year. It's before we start heading into the holiday and the end of the year. So if you're launching, you know, August, speaking of summer slumps, maybe August is the time when you really buckle down and do a bunch of episodes to take you through that, that second new year and going to the next season for your your podcast. Catherine, um, if I could make one yes. other point on the audience, please. Oh, sorry to yes. You. Um, also keep in mind, if you have an audience slump, think about what your goals are for your podcast. Your goal might not be as many listeners or as many clicks as possible. Your goal might be to ha- use your podcast as a branding tool. Your goal might be to reach a specific segment of the population. Uh, for example, one of my clients is the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. Their target audience is... Uh, their target audience is bone marrow recipients and the people who take care of them. They have a cap by nature on how many people are going to listen to that show. It's only going to be a specific subset of the population. Yeah, talk about niche. Yeah, exactly. So you may not, you may, you may hit your peak in terms of your potential audience. So think right. about the purpose of your podcast and don't be discouraged if uh, you don't have a million downloads. That might not be the main point of why you're doing the podcast. Yeah. And I mean, on a logistic sense, you probably don't need a million pod, uh, downloads for that. And it does, it might be distracting from your, your goal, your mission goal there too. Matt, I know you had something about seasons. Yeah. If you do take the summer off for your podcast, that's fine. But can you let people know that you've taken the summer off for your podcast? So 
Maybe yeah. you want to leave a message in the RSS feed saying, okay, we're going to be back last week of August, first week of September with brand new episodes. That way you can set a date. You can also leave it in the description field. Just something you might want to do if you're going to be um, you know, taking that time off and really any break, anytime you have to take a break and use the RSS feed. By the way, if you, if you put it in there, you, you don't have to keep it up there for too long. It can just, just be for uh, one or two weeks. And then when you release your new episode come uh, end of summer, um, you can remove it. Can we play that scenario out for a second, Catherine, just of, of, ta yes. of that idea of taking a break? So we're talking about this this growth rut. And maybe the best way to get yourself out of that rut is to just take a break. So what do we do when we take the break from the podcast? You're not necessarily putting episodes out. Maybe you've batch recorded some episodes. So now you've got a, you know, a six or seven week lead time of episodes that are still going out. But you personally, as the host, you're not recording anything. Maybe it's okay to kind of just leave your podcast alone locked locked away in the closet for a while i wouldn't recommend that i would recommend it to take some time to work on other aspects of the podcast revisit a deep dive into your metrics what episodes are performing really well do you need to change your content going forward as jag mentioned you have a goal for your show does that goal need to change at all going forward so you can use those breaks and you combine it with the summer slump if you're going to take a break during the summer you there's a ton of things that you can do to sort of tighten the screws around your show and so you come back in the fall with a totally different mindset you're refreshed you're relaxed and you're ready to dive back into your podcast again that is an amazing teaser for our next segment but before we get there hold on to that what johnny was just saying i do want to just close the audience rut part just be, think by reminding people that one of the things that we all preach, the all the super friends here, is that podcasting is a long-term proposition. We all should be looking at podcasting as a long haul or the long game. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about that before we move on. Because the short term, I don't think people, people are going to get a little bit uh, dissatisfied or a little bit demoralized if they're trying to come in and having instant growth when they are come launching their podcast. So let's give a, a little encouragement for people about that long-term game with podcasting before we move on to another rut. Matt, I know you have a lot of thoughts on this particular topic. Yeah. So I actually had a, a conversation with somebody today and they were 27 episodes in on a, on a podcast and they were like, well, how, how do I make money? How do I start doing that? And I'm like, well, it's, three years to build an audience. Um, and listen, the episodes are great. The show is great, but you've got to give this thing some significant time in order to, to really uh, build it up. And it wasn't really the fact that he's got 27 episodes. It's, it's, he's been doing it, um, I think, for just a handful of months. And it really does take a, a long time to, to, you know, to build it up. And also, you know, it's expectations. But, you know, there's, you're going to need more than one way to make money. There's very, very few people in podcasting who are making it solely from advertising money. So I think you need to think about building the audience first. So do you have a newsletter? Do you have a website? Do you have all the tools necessary to, uh, to really be increasing that audience? And so when you take that step back, uh, I think it's a good time to take stock about what your marketing um, tools are. And, you know, are you using Instagram? Are you doing Instagram well? Should you do TikTok? But these are all questions you need to ask yourself. But, you know, in the end, it's really audience building and it's yeah. brick by brick. And David, I know you are really great Catherine, at kind you're of muted. I, I am not no, muted. She's not. No. <laughs> How no. dare you, sir? <laughs> Do not stifle my voice. Uh, David, I know that you have some really great, I, you always are great at conveying, to, especially to clients, about this sort of the long term game, uh, thinking about their podcast. What are some yeah. of your best words of wisdom? Um, Matt stole them all. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm, out, I'm out. I'm flat. No, that's not. Right, so, I mean, just again, picking up on what Matt said, it, it's a good time to take stock. If there's nothing wrong with, taking the whole summer off there's nothing wrong with taking four weeks off but it's a great chance to stop and then really plan for what you're going to do when you return and you know change is is necessary i think to keep yourself motivated to keep your listeners coming back and you don't want to change <clears throat> pardon me the vision of the show or the necessarily the the angle of the show but there are so many different things you can do. You can say, you know, next next time we're going to change, you know, I mean, pick maybe three things, three things. We're going to do a new intro to the show. The first five minutes is going to be more compelling. It's going to break. We're going to get people to the guest quicker. We're going to do 
a segment of icebreaker questions that we've never done. You come up with a clever package for that or whatever. And then maybe we're going to market it a different way. We're going to go to every episode. We're going to have, you know, two posts on LinkedIn during the course of the week, highlighting this episode with, you know, this video promo or something. So pick a couple things that you're going to change that will, you know, continue to engage your listeners, but also make it sort of more enjoyable for you because you got into it to be successful. But if you're not enjoying it anymore, then, you know, your, your listeners can get burned out. You can get burned out too. Yeah. Okay. So we've had, we could keep going about audience growth, right? Because it is so prevalent and it really is always rumbling in the background for every podcaster. But I think we should put a pin in that and go on to our next rut that we want to tell people about and help them get out of it or stay away from it. And that is the content rut. Now, David and Johnny have both sort of gave us a little scintillating teaser for that topic. And that, let me describe first what the content rut is. When you launch a podcast, a podcast can become a content monster. You've got to have ideas. You've got to have guests. You've got to have all the stuff that you're putting into your show that you get down there and then put out to your audience, uh, whatever schedule that you have, whether it's weekly, whether it's for your season, it just uh, it's consuming all of your ideas at a, all the time. So one of the problems with that, though, is that you can get, as a podcast maker, you can get a little bit in a rut because there's so many other things about your show that you're just kind of putting on autopilot. Are you using the same kind of guest? Are you having the same sort of segments? Are you not keeping those kinds of things fresh just because you're trying to keep up with the flow of getting your show out there? So that's a little bit of the content monster. Like I said, we've had a little couple of teasers on that, but I want to hear from the, the group what is is some of your tactics for dealing with that content rut that when we start not being fresh or not innovating the way that we could or should, or really that we want to with our shows. Johnny, why don't we start with you? I mean, you can call it a content run. You could call it burnout, but every podcaster eventually runs into kind of that wall that we're talking about of you just don't feel as inspired as you did before and you kind of you feel yourself spinning your wheels so maybe that's time that you branch out into a different direction or maybe it's time that you deep dive into something really specific maybe if your podcast is covering uh i work with a lot of real estate podcasts so i always go to the real estate uh the real estate examples. But if you're doing a real estate podcast and you feel yourself in a content rut, maybe you look back at some really high performing episodes and you say, okay, look, this residential real estate expert that I had on this episode did super well. Can I dig a little bit deeper and maybe pull two or three episodes worth of content out of this? And then again, go with across the industry that your podcast covers. If your podcast is over a specific industry, so if you're finding yourself in a content rut, maybe it's deep diving into something that you've already covered rather than trying to find something brand new and feeling dis, uh, disillusioned, I guess is the word, with not being able to find something new. Maybe you go back and try and deep dive into something else that can really kind of spark that passion again for why you're doing your podcast and you know give you other content ideas. And maybe like, let's, uh, I'm going to throw out this question here too, just to maybe hone us in a little bit uh, for the discussion purposes. And that is, how do you guys judge what is working? What is, how do you, how do you assess what's going well or what's working for the podcast that you work on? I always go with reaction and I always look at the downloads and go, oh, well that got a lot of reaction. Mm. But then I go somewhere and I meet people, you know, my audience and they say, oh, well, this was the episode I liked. And I go, that got hardly any downloads. So you don't you don't really know necessarily from the downloads if you got reaction um, from that in, in particular. This is really about listening to your audience. And do you have ways to listen to your audience and interact with them? Uh, because they're going to give you feedback. I don't want to give everybody a job and say, well, you know, a survey is a great way to do it. But interacting with people on social media and asking about episodes and sometimes just, you know, slipping into their DMs when, and, and when they, you know, reply to your post and just say, what do you want to, who do you want to hear on the show? Yeah, what do you want to hear more of? Yeah, what, what, what do you enjoy? And just asking that question, because they would love to, to give that back to you. But so often we're so hell-bent on just getting stuff out there and giving a show. We don't really take the time to say, well, you're the listener. What would you like to hear? 
it's really about having that two-way conversation. I have a client that uh, just, I think she just had two, 350,000 downloads total for her show. And she sends out an annual survey every December when things start to slow down around the holidays. And she gives away, I think it's a $50 Amazon gift card to a randomly to a person who filled out the survey. So there's a little bit of a carrot there. And that 50 bucks for her is money well invested to get uh, the feedback on her show. What would you like to hear more of? What would you like to hear less of? Are there any shows you didn't particularly like? Are there shows you did particularly like? What are we missing? What um, what topics would you like covered? Just like Matt was saying, all those types of topics, getting that feedback not only is valuable to you in terms of the currency of the data, but also it shows your audience that you care and you're listening to them and you're not sort of screaming into the void and making it a one-way conversation. It's a two-way conversation to get that feedback. And you don't have to do a formal listener survey like, um, <clears throat> I mean, it, that does feel like kind of a chore. Not to mention that, I don't know about you, but I have to really love a podcast for me to respond and go, I'm going to do this listener survey. However, you can do things like if you're active on Facebook, for example, I mentioned this music podcast we did. We have an upcoming episode on the the best cowbell songs in rock and roll history, right? There's more than one. I would like more, more cowbell, so, whatever yes, it is. There's, there's, right. There's more than just fear the reaper uh, Jag. So, um, but if, if I post that on Facebook, just a question saying, Hey, we here at the podcast are wondering what's your favorite song that has a cowbell. I guarantee you we'll get at least half a dozen. And some of them may be people that don't even listen to the show, but so what now mm -hmm. on the show, you can say, you can, you can give a shout out to, Six in, in addition to kind of getting your reader feed uh, listener feedback as to what you should be talking about, you can shout out, you know, those five people. And we just it's like, hey, real quick, before we get to our list of the top cowbell songs, we got to point out, you know, Christine chimed in and she said this and, you know, Catherine chimed in and she said this. And then you can tag them when you post the podcast. Now you've got six people who are so excited to have been mentioned in your podcast. And it's that's a great way of keeping listener engagement up. I'm not sure if anybody on the call is um, on a does the Peloton bike at all or does Peloton classes, but in the Peloton, that was so 2020, Jack. I know, but in <laughs> in the Peloton classes, if you take them live, they will shout you out if it's your birthday. They will shout you out if you hit a milestone, if it's your hundredth, second, two hundredth, or seven hundredth ride. And people really enjoy that, just like uh, yeah. to the old radio days of you know giving the shout out on the radio people like that stuff don't be afraid to Absolutely. do that and people really oh my my favorite podcast mentioned me on the podcast and maybe that means hey they're sharing it with their friends check out this podcast he mentioned me yeah, so we, Catherine, we, we've Catherine got, sorry so, go ahead david yeah um, super quick i mean some people won't even notice other people will write long emails thanking you oh that was so nice for you to do that and mm -hmm. meanwhile it was it was uh 30 seconds of your time to do that so Sorry, so, John. Catherine, is the consensus that we're getting on this content run one of the biggest takeaways from this section is don't be don't like don't put all this unnecessary pressure on yourself that you now have to because you're the host and the the founder, I guess, of this podcast, you now have to come up with all the ideas to get yourself out of this content run. You should look as an avenue to rely on other people, rely on the people that listen to your podcast that engage with you on social media, just throw, just cast that net out there. It's kind of the, kind of the whole, you know, summed up in one sentence. Yeah, I agree. And also like to maybe to Matt's point is that when you using audience engagement as a guide is a great way to assess how your show is doing. And I've had the frustrating experience too, where the most impactful meaningful episodes that I've been a part of are often the ones that don't have the, that don't have the downloads that we were hoping to get but that's okay because it is fulfilling something else you know especially if it does have an impact or if it does have a lot of meaning to it for for somebody in specifically that that is its own reward and you know that is you know in a lot of ways why we're in in podcasting but I will say this too is that if you would like audience engagement you got to make sure that there's a path by which your audience can engage you, whether yes. it is through social media, whether it is through having your email address on tell the them show how notes, to find you. How, tell them how to find you, tell them how you would like them to engage and then respond that way in kind. And, and do that at the end of the podcast, not at the beginning, because if it's a business transaction, if you come on the podcast and someone's listening to you who doesn't know you from Adam and you start saying, here's my social media, here's my email, here's my phone number, here's my website. What as a listener, why would I bother? I don't know you, you haven't given me anything of value. 
value. If you give me good content for a half hour, 45 minutes, however long it is, you then have the license to say, hey, if you enjoyed the content and want to reach out and connect with me, here's how to do it. Don't ask for something before you give your audience something. It's also a good experiment in, t t in t finding who your super fans are, your mm -hmm. most dedicated listeners, because the people that love your podcast the most, they're going to listen through to the entire episode, if not 85, 90% of it. Yeah. And if they're listening through to the entire episode, then they go, oh, now I can find Jag on Twitter and he knows that's the best way to get in touch with him. I love his podcast so much. I listened through the whole freaking episode. Of course, I'm going to DM him on Twitter and give him my thoughts on what he wants uh, what we want to hear next. So sliding into Jags DMS, we've exactly. all been there and those DMS are flooded. So get in line. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the po podcaster, Adam Carolla, the comedian, I'm a fan of the way he puts his show together at the very end of his show. The last thing you hear is some callback to something somebody said during the course of the podcast. It's usually something that's taken out of context and it's usually very funny, whatever it is. I stole that idea for a couple of podcasts I do. It's a nice kind of dirty trick to let, let make the listeners stick around to the end, like you said, Jack. And the, your real listeners will get that. will stick around and, and, you know, have some reaction to whatever you put at the end. Set that expectation, yeah. And, uh, you know, even uh, Ira Glass from This American Life, I've heard him say that that's one. He believes that that's a big part of their show, getting people to listen all the way to the end is because they always have some sort of like funny out of context, almost like a blooper right there at the end. Yeah, almost like an Easter egg. Like you want yeah. to stick around to hear that's what a that better is. word. Easter egg, yeah. 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 OK, and I'm just going to put a vote because I love to check show notes. I think I'm the only person in the United States who checks show notes for links to things that I want. But I like to have a way that I can get their their social media or to email them or contact them that they are through. Well, let show me ask notes. you this as a podcast. Yeah. Even if you are in the minority, Catherine, would you rather someone not click your show notes or someone click your show notes looking for something that isn't there? Absolutely. Always put all your links in the show notes. I agree. Thank you. For just yeah, if, even if it's just my benefit or for everybody else, Johnny. People are people are doing stuff while they're listening to your show. They're driving. They're at the gym. They're doing house chores. I mean, scrolling no one's phone. scrolling on their phone. No one like as I hear DM me on Twitter at Jag in Detroit. What do I, I got to write this down? I'm not going to remember that. There's so many different things going on. Oh, I could just scroll right to the show notes, DM me on Twitter. Boom, there it is. Click. Here's my feedback for the show. It's amazing. Don't change anything. And it really is in the show notes, to your point, Johnny, a valuable resource. If you have a visual for somebody in the podcast and you're trying to explain something that doesn't just come across well in only audio, hey, there's a graph of this on this website, or hey, I explained this in detail on my website. If you want more information, the link is right there in the show notes. I, I work with a lot of financial advisors. Sometimes they talk about facts and figures, it's something you could not follow an audio only listening in a car. But hey, you want to see what this graph looks like? Links in the show notes for you to check out You know when you're not driving. And that can get super creative. I remember doing one episode where uh, the host was describing what's called a, the barbell theory in real estate. The barbell meaning one end of the barbell is this cluster of uh, very active neighborhoods and then other really active neighborhoods on the other side of town. What's that main street in the middle? And even as I'm describing it with my hands and the people listening, you can't figure that out. So I went into Google Maps. I found the neighborhoods that he was talking about, and I was actually able to draw a barbell in Google Maps, uh, connect the barbell together, save it as a link, and put that link in the show notes. Oh, wow. I have no idea if anybody ever looked for that, but the you know the one person that was like, what the hell is he talking about, finds it in the show notes and clicks that. There's so many things that you can do adding that visual component to it. Matt, I want to draw you back into this conversation here. And you, one of the things I notice about some of the shows that you work on, especially including your own show, The Sound Off uh, Asked, is that you are great about experimenting with different formats. So like with Sound Off, you've got a narrative part portion as well as interview portion. Can you give us anybody any tips on keeping the format fresh in, in the podcast? Yeah, so that comes back to the writing. So most of the episodes are interview and a little bit of narration. But sometimes I think people really like lots of narration. So maybe instead of, I'll just, you know, divide an interview into two, here's A, here's B, here's C. That's very cookie cutter. And I've been doing that a lot. And I guess what I see the downloads sort of inching down a little bit and a little bit less engagement. It comes back to writing. And so maybe I should be writing more mm. and really telling people's stories. So I've got um, an interview coming up with Ariel Nissenblatt. Well, she's got a big backstory. And maybe I should be narrating into that maybe four or five times instead of normally just twice. 
So that's a way just to keep re-engaging the audience and giving little tidbits. So if something isn't working, whether it's on the radio or in podcast or any form of audio, or it really co does come down to your writing. So how can you write into the show to engage the listener a, a little deeper? And that's something that takes a little more time. And as I was thinking about it today, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to have to you know, pick up my writing and create and produce just a little bit tighter and for shorter segments during the podcast. On the rare occasions where I've tried that, Matt, I, I've the reason why I don't do it is probably because um, we all can be lazy. And it's like you get done with the interview and you're like, oh, now I got to go back and write all these little vignettes. The times I've done them well is go back. Um, it helps, I think, to transcribe the podcast mm -hmm. and then find three spots where you can just go in and sort of preview what's coming up next. And maybe it's as simple as just talking into your microphone and just it's just almost extemporaneously. That way it doesn't become such a chore in your brain. Like I got to write this and edit it and everything um, that might accomplish it. So but I, I, I'm going to try that more often, Matt. I think it's great. Um, Alec Baldwin's pod, podcast. I don't know if he does it anymore. We all know he's, uh, you know, kind of taking a break from things. But um, he, he would his was really simple, but he would say, you know, but but it would bring you in and be like. Jerry Seinfeld started as a young man who got cut from his little league team. And then he, and, and it sort of brings you in. It's like, Oh, now I'm excited to hear what's, what's coming next. You're and almost, there's kind of, the, sorry, go ahead, Jack. You're, you're almost taking your audience by the hand and leading them through the interview as a sort of a trusted guide. You're their interview Sherpa, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of what David said about it being, you know, you kind of dread, Oh God, I just finished that interview. Now I got to go back and do the more that you do that type of podcast, and I'm sure Matt has gotten to the point to where he'll be listening to what the guest is saying and mentally take a note or physically take a note to save time. This is where I'm going to jump in and drop some commentary because we're about to transition to the next segment. As you get more experience and more comfortable behind the microphone, you kind of just pick up on those things and it just becomes a skill that you develop over time or just have a, pa a pad and paper right next to you. 25 minutes, 22 seconds plus sign that's where you know you're going to go back in and drop something in so you can make it a lot easier on yourself so don't you know don't look at that of you know podcasters out there if you're dreading sort of this giant brick wall of oh my god i gotta add something else into just interviewing this person you can make it you know life easier for yourself by doing those things quick side note if any of our audience uses the roadcaster pro to record their podcast there is a little flag button on the display that mm -hmm. if you wanted to mark a certain piece of the audio or a certain timestamp in the audio you hit that button and then all you've got to do is pull one of your blank tracks like mike four or something like that and the track will only be those marks you can line it up and say okay i marked at 1006 and 1312 and 1709 and that, that's an easy, cheat way to do it if you have a Roadcaster Pro. Is that a good transition into tech? Uh, yes. Well, although it is, let's, let's use that as another scintillating preview teaser. of what's to come. A teaser, if you would. Because I do want to ask one question before, because we were talking about the content rut, getting out of it. I want to ask you guys about taking risks with your podcast. Because risks sometimes can feel what's the word? Risky. And you don't want to do things that alienate your audience or that the audience hates necessarily, but you it's r taking risks, maybe trying things that are new are a way to keep things fresh. But like I said, you don't want to do anything where you turn off your audience. So I want to just hear some thoughts from everybody about risk taking, um, how they approach it with their own shows, how they approach it with their clients. Is that even a part of the conversation? I think so. I, I think risk taking goes hand in hand with changing things up in a creative way. It's going to keep you motivated, and it's and it's you stand to you stand to upset some listeners because listeners will like the format of your show, and it's like that "Who moved my cheese?" phenomenon. However, I'll give you a quick example of uh, a risk that one of uh, my podcasters is about to embark on. He he. Uh, so Evan Shine is a divorce lawyer who I produce a show for him called Shine On. And typically he interviews people in the divorce industry, whether it be mediators or therapists or people that have something to do with divorce. But it, you know, it must wear on him a little bit because he's kind of it's not that he's exhausted everyone in the industry, but, you know, over and over again. And so he had a, a an expert on that had written a book about friendship. It was all about friendship and, ha and how friendships are more important now than ever. And he said to me, um, how about as a compliment to that episode, um, 
I actually get some of my friends to be on the show. It sounds like a simple idea, but I was like, it's a great idea. Get like two, two people. And maybe the three of you have been friends since college or high school, whatever it is. So that's, I would label that as a risk. He usually has mm. professionals on. He's trying something completely different. Just so why not? I mean, what's the concept? Not? What's it like being friends with a divorce lawyer? <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> Evan, that- we know where the, we know where the skeletons are and you're making a huge mistake. <laughs> But Go but you'll lie. be surprised. Your your listeners will sometimes will love that kind of stuff. You know, if I've always I haven't done this yet, but I've always wanted to have like my dad on the show for mm-hmm. Father's Day. Just talk to my dad. Like I think people will really dig that. Maybe I don't know. But but those those are the kind of risks. Think of a completely different kind of guest that you would never have on the show, and just invite him on and see what happens. I think it's important to have in mind what the point of your show is, what the core mission of your show is. In terms of taking a risk, you can certainly play with the stuff on the periphery. You can play with, you know, having a a guest that might not be part of your typical canon of guests. You might have, uh, you might try something, you know, new intro, new outro, new segment, things like that. But try to remember what your selling point is, what your hook point is that's getting people to listen to your podcast. And for me, I would say the risk factor, risk reward. You know, yeah. you, do, you you can take a chance on something, but as long as it's not going to get you away from the core of what you're doing in the podcast, that's my litmus test. That's a great point. Yeah, there, risk uh, implies the idea that it's going to have a payoff. So that's really that's really good. Any other risky comments before we move on? We teased it just a moment ago. We are going to move into a tech rut. And I just wanted to share a quick story about what, this was really the inspiration for this rut focused live stream today. And it was that, you know, I use Zoom as we're all Zoomers now that we are post pandemic and we all use Zoom all the time. And Zoom started saying, hey, we've got all these amazing features. We've done a whole new upgrade to our dashboard. And we would love you to to take you on a tour of all these new features. And I was like, that sounds Fabulous. Not this second, because I in two minutes, I'm supposed to be at the Zoom meeting. So I just <laughs> I got to say no right now. But I'm sure I'll get back to it. OK, well, they have offered this tour of the new dashboard to Zoom 387 times and 387 times I have clicked. Not right now, but please remind me later. And I just kind of felt a little convicted about the tech rut. And I know it's not just Zoom. This happens for other things, too. We It took me the longest time to start using some of the different features of Descript. And now that I am, I'm just beyond in love with what they can offer. But it was always never enough time to break that into my workflow. And now, you know, it it really ended up costing me time uh, because I couldn't get those new tech advances built into, into what I was doing. So there is a tech rut. All of us do things with our podcasts that are pretty tech heavy. We do also have a workflow that is just trying to help us keep everything going and get our shows out for our clients and for ourselves. So I want to hear about the tech rut. What are you guys doing to make sure that you're always up on top of what your all the features are? How do you break that in? How do you spend time learning all the new features and how to use them effectively? How do we avoid the tech rut? Um, if if one of the goals of the of getting out of the tech rut is to save time when you're not actually podcasting for people that are either professionally producing podcasts like the five of us, or if you're just producing your own podcasts, the easiest thing that you can do right away is just have a stock recorded intro and outro. You probably tee up uh, each episode individually, but you probably have an episode or an intro to your podcast and an outro to your podcast. You can have those saved and use the same one every single time. That saves time of recording it every single week. And doing all of your audio plugins and adjusting the volume every single week. Same with music. If you have music in your intro or outro, if you have music that goes underneath your episode specific intro, maybe you can't have one that goes in there every single time because your uh, episode intro is different and you have to record that every single time, but the volume fades in and out. You can have that pre-adjusted and ready to just drop in every single time. So kind of look for those little hacks. What are things that I'm doing every single time when I'm producing an episode? Can I automate that? Can I have that saved somewhere on a file on my computer where I could just drop it in and not have to worry about it ever again? 
that might be when you're writing your show notes. You might have a uh, stock set of links you put in your show notes. Maybe you save that in a Word doc and it's copy paste. Same idea. Mm. Um, I, I, a quick dovetail off of this. So, uh, you know, we talked about ruts. And on the tech side, sometimes if you're in a rut as a podcaster and you need to freshen something up, Sometimes a new piece of equipment. I know not everybody's an audio geek like most of us are, but sometimes, and, and that well, gives me a chance. I wanted to ask Johnny about this for the benefit of our listeners. The microphone that you can see, or that we can see, that if you're listening to us later on the podcast, Johnny has. For a while now, I have uh, recommended either a high or low end microphone to my uh, clients in terms of price point. The uh, Samsung Q2U or ATR 2100X is going to run you between 70 and 100 bucks. It's a great mic. On the high end of things, the Shure SM7B or the RE20 is going to run you four or $500, but Shure has a middle-of-the-road microphone. If Johnny, could you just mention that right now? It's uh, Shure, is, it's Shure yes. MV7, right? This is the MV7 XLR only. So Shure has released sort of budget-friendly XLR ver or budget-friendly versions of the SM7B. This It's called the MV7. You can get it in the XLR only version, which is the one I'm using, or you can get it with a USB attachment as well. This one costs about 150, and the uh, MV7 with a USB uh, plug-in built into it is about 250. So I really only bought this because I'm doing more live streams now with you guys. I'm doing a lot of consults online. I also go and record live on site with other people. So I have Shure SM7Bs, and I would just have to unscrew it and unplug it and pack mm -hmm. it away every single time. And so I was like, okay, what's a middle of their own microphone that I can use? Uh, that I can reasonably afford that's going to make me look professional, sound professional, but isn't going to break the bank by having to unnecessarily add another SM or uh, SM7B to my roster. Now the the microphones, it just saves me time of not having to bring the microphone out of my go bag, set it all back up, XLR cables and everything. You could say it was an unnecessary purchase. It was more of a want than a need. But it's also <laughs> another reason is because I am getting a lot more clients that are recording remotely from home using Riverside, using the MV7, and it's a microphone that I recommend, and it's hard for me to recommend a microphone to people that I don't actually use or yes, have experience right. with. So it's sort of a, there are a lot of factors that went into it, but I think it sounds great. I, I've had nothing but a uh, great experience with it so far. And so it's the MV7. And to bring it back around, Johnny, uh, you're, what you just described is you're automating one of your processes. You're exactly. saving yourself time by disassembling and assembling the more expensive mic every time, and you've got that ready to go when you need it. So yep. uh, same idea. By the way, Sure Microphone's not a sponsor of the podcast. Super <laughs> not fans, yet. But, but, <laughs> all, I mean, I, I think both great points. I made a decision once that I feel like I do half my job from home, during the pandemic, a lot more from home. Everything's remote, so easy to do it at home. And half from my my studio. And I was schlepping my Rodecaster Pro back and forth, you know, in a carrying case. I finally said, I'm going to splurge and I'm going to get a second one. And it's not a small purchase that, you know, we all know they're 600 bucks. So it, it's not a it's not an impulse buy. But I am so happy I have two now. Uh, so it, it just it makes anything that makes life easier. I'll give a real quick example. Um, we were talking about the Descript app earlier. Also not a sponsor of the podcast, Super Friends yet, but call us. Um, so I, what I used to do is I used to record on the Roadcaster Pro on the on the internal, um, what's it called, the data card, the SSD the card, micro that was, SD card, yep, yeah, SD card, and um, and then it, so there's a process there. I got to transfer it over. I got to pull it into Descript and let it transcribe. And notice Descript has a function where you can just you can record right into the Descript app. Not everybody everybody might not be a fan of that. But I tried it, and so then I record it. It's transcribing as I go, and then the podcast is over, and I've already, I'm now I'm ready to edit like immediately. So that like and like what you were saying, Johnny, about how you know you have to slap the mic, but it's almost more of a mental thing. Like it's a thing to get over and making your life easier. Yeah, will be more inspired. More specifically, it's a the back end production, like the audio engineering side of it. If you as the host are recording in the same environment, you're recording with the same microphone, it's obviously your same voice every single time. In your DAW, whether you're using Adobe Audition, whether you're using Reaper, whether you're using Logic Pro X, not so sure about uh, what's the free one called that Steve Stewart uses. Uh, Audacity. 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 Not so sure about Audacity. I don't think Audacity does plugins, but you can save channel strips of all of the plugins that you use, your EQs, your compressors, your voice, your vocal writer, whatever you're using to give yourself that kind of punchy voice on the back end, make yourself 
uh, audio compliant in terms of volume, limiters, things like that. You can save all of that as a strip and I have it saved. That just says Johnny MV7 microphone. If I record something into Logic, I click that, boom. My voice is exactly the way I want it to sound every single time without having to go through. All right, what does this guy need here, here, and here? And I do that with all of my clients. I've got Chris, I've got Jason, I've got Jeff, I got everybody. They they all record in different environments, different microphones, and that saves me so much time. Obviously, you know, environments change, things like that. And in that case, yes, someone will require a little bit more attention. But in the most case, it saves me a ton of time of having to put in the plugins manually that I already know need to go in there. Johnny's actual voice sounds like Pee Wee Herman. So you, 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 now you know, you know, it's <laughs> a work. real endorsement of the, of this mic. Right. Well, you know, guys, I was thinking too about the, the tech rut is that, you know, in, in business, there's this idea of working in your business versus working on your business. Yes. Right. And that you need to have dedicated time where you're working on your business, because that's the thing that will help you grow. And Matt, I'm going to turn it to you and just ask you about that. Do you see any overlaps between this tech rut that people can get in and that same concept of working on your business? I think it, it does come down to time because most of what you're talking about, you know, we talked about saving time in there and time is money and, and all that stuff. On two occasions, I've gone to look outside the business to, to help one was a podcast and the other one was the business overall. And the first example is I have another podcast called the hot air podcast, but it hasn't fared all that well. It doesn't really have a lot of brand identity, but I did ask three people who are podcasters. What do you think of this? And I let them write a little bit and then I used it as feedback and I really let them sort of consult to this. So mm. this podcast will more than likely be, be changed and revamped and we're going to do a little bit of a rebrand on it, but it was important for me to look outside to other podcasters to say, could you take a listen to this and see if this is any good and what would you do? And they're, they were more than happy to help. And on the tech side of things, I really sort of struggled with, with transcription and whether or not we should actually have it. And I, I'm still not really a fan of, you know, having somebody sort of work on transcription and type it out and listen back to shows. I was really worried about the time and I'm thinking in the end, why is my business paying for this? when Apple and Spotify and Amazon all have the technology for this. All that set aside, you know, I did ask uh, Rob Greenlee and, and James Cridland. Actually, I tweeted that them in the middle of podcast movement. And <laughs> they did reply on Twitter, but they came back with some really good ideas about what I could do to include that in my business. So my advice is just reach out. You know, mm -hmm. find other people who are maybe podcasters or doing what you do or like-minded in your business and, and ask them. And And you know, be constructive with the feedback and find a way to bring it in. And as a result, I never thought I'd have transcription on any of these podcasts, but here we are. Not only do we have transcription, but we have a sponsor, Poden.io, who will transcribe this episode and other ones. Excellent. And that was an unplanned tie-in, but I'm grateful for it. Jag, sorry. To I was going to say, that's kind of how the five of us all became such great friends and colleagues, was asking each other for advice on things, whether it was a client issue, a tech issue, a content issue, any of these things. Hey, where do you go for this? Where do you go for that? If you're a podcaster, find somebody who listens to podcasts. They don't have to be a professional paid in the space. Find somebody who likes listening to podcasts and ask them for feedback on your show. And to Matt's point, this goes with a tech rut, a content rut, any of these ruts we've talked about. Get that fresh perspective. What I found in the podcast space is it's incredibly collaborative. It's far more likely if you ask for somebody's help or advice in the space that they'll answer you as opposed to blow you off. I, that's what I, one of the things I love about working in the space is the collaborative nature of it. That's a great point. And it's good People to People answer you. I don't get answers. <laughs> I get left on red all the time. We answer you, Johnny. I know you guys do. <laughs> yeah, we answer you, Johnny. <laughs> well, and I, I think that, I mean, not to get not to get mushy here at the end, but I think part of what we're doing here with this live stream is to be giving about the information and the experience that we have from creating podcasts for clients, creating podcasts for ourselves. So show people that we're willing to help out and you know when we make those calls that we'll get that great constructive help back uh, so i think that that seems like an amazing way to wrap this all up i think that we have I think we have steered some people absolutely clear of some very dangerous ruts that can be really a hindrance to your podcast game we've gotten out of the an audience rut the content rut and of course the tech rut uh, Matt, why don't you tell everybody how they can learn, how they can reach out and ask you a favor. Also, uh, maybe give you some uh, give you some kudos for today. 
Sound Off Podcast is the flagship podcast of the Sound Off Podcast Network. I can be reached at Matt at soundoffpodcast.com. And he, uh, Matt is a good tweeter, so you should certainly follow him on Twitter and see him on Instagram. Jag, how can we find out more about you? It's all Jag in Detroit. All my social is Jag in Detroit. My website is jagindetroit.com, J-A-G, and my email is jag at jagindetroit.com. Always happy to help out for anybody who has any questions. David Yaz in Boston. The Boston Podcast Network, pod617.com. In pod, we trust. And since I threw him the starting question so many times, he is going to be the last wrapping it up here. Johnny, Johnny Podcast, how do we find out more about you? Best way is on Twitter. Follow me at Johnny Podcast. My DMs are open. If you have any questions, want to talk about your podcast, anything at all, or you want to know where I got this hat, just shoot me a DM on Twitter. That's the best way to reach me. Kind of do. Yeah. Just don't keep everybody waiting. Where did you get that hat? Fort Worth Locals. Mm. Mm. Wow. And Catherine, and my don't forget your own plug. I wasn't. My <laughs> name is Catherine O'Brien. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Hello, Catherine O. And again, my company is Branch Out Programs. Wow. This was fun, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next time, the bald guys will wear the hats and the guy yeah. with the hair won't. <laughs> uh, excuse job, me. Don't, don't ignore this mane here I've got. Flowing locks. We love it. Yeah. Flowing Thank you. Locks.